Hi, this is Luis Souza from rawveganpower.com and we have a very talented and creative guest today, Jeremy Sa Safran. He is one of the pioneers of the raw food movement and I'm so proud to be able to talk to you today, Jeremy. Welcome. I, I, I'm real, I really appreciate the, the, the time to come here. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thanks. Yeah, glad to be here. And I was uh, reading through your, your story and it's uh, pretty interesting because you were a raw vegan, you were writing books and you were promoting all this uh, move it in, uh, movement at its uh, really start, right? I, I, it was like uh, being a hippie in the 1960s or something like that, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Could you share, share about that, please? Well, yeah, I, I had, you know, it was an amazing thing for me. I, I had met a, a fellow on a, in New York, on a trip to New York when I was, I lived in New York and I was living up in Vermont at the time, went down to visit and met this fellow and ended up on a, a bus ride with him all the way back to Vermont. And the whole time he just talked to me about vegan food. And, and I, at the time, was vegetarian and was very interested. You know, I was 18 years old, and I was, like, interested in this whole, you know, expansion of consciousness and better living through health and better choices. And a lot of it had to do with being an activist and really making a statement against what was going on with the slaughterhouse, what was going on with commercialization of food all over. And so this, uh, this guy, you know, said, listen, you know, take it to the next level. Let's take it and, and make it vegan. And there was just so many omens along this bus ride and so many things that happened. And finally, even in, in the last moments, we, we, we got off the bus at the wrong stop, had this huge <laughs> run. We had a run in in the middle of the night with the police standing outside of this closed uh, hotel trying to use the phone to call a cab. And I kind of, in that moment, came this big revelation. And I was like, listen, if we get out of this, I I'm going vegan tomorrow. I'm sure enough, the spirits just stepped right in and like, they let us go instantly. And I was like, how did that just happen? And I was like, obviously, this is the path I'm supposed to be on. And soon after that, I uh, met a woman in New York City who was a raw foodist. And she started turning me on even more to raw food, saying, listen, you're taking it from vegetarian to vegan. You know, let's, let's check out some of this raw food thing. I really liked what she was doing. And I went and lived with her. She was a friend of Amy Moore's, deep into uh, T.C. Fry's work, and was friends with him at the time, with a lot of the people that were kind of from the 60s, like the people that started promoting juicing, fasting. Fantastic. Fast. And so we went together. We, we lived with Anne Wigmore. We lived down in Puerto Rico at her institute. And we really worked every day with her, spent a lot of time. And I, I'd grown up studying martial arts. I was into uh, Shaolin Kung Fu. And so I knew how to use weapons. And there was a big, huge pile of coconuts that they had taken down from the trees because it was dangerous to have the coconut there where everyone was walking around. But no one even knew anything to do with them. Well, I found this old machete, and I said, hey, I know how to use a sword. And there's all these coconuts. And boom, I started opening the coconuts, <laughs> coconuts at the Institute. And it became a, a, a huge thing there. So normally, you just go there drinking wheatgrass, a little bit of energy soup. But all of a sudden, we all had coconuts, and it was really helping with the cleansing and really helping because a lot of us were there. Me and my friends were there because we were so interested in doing this for nature, for our bodies, for our health, for the future, for the planet. But most of the people that were coming through there were sick. They had cancer. They had diseases. And it was amazing to us that she was healing these things. But none of us, we were all young. We didn't have any diseases. We were there because we believed in it. And so when we left the Institute, all of us went out and started really promoting it and, and talking about it more. And uh, I began a catering company, which I, I, like, really my whole thing was music, magic, and martial arts. Those were the things that were, like, really defining my life, the things that meant something to me. I was a musician. I was really into studying all different kinds of, like, uh, mystic traditions. And I was really into Kung Fu. But this food thing just kind of fell in my lap through the situation through me wanting to be more conscious, more evolved, and I saw the magic in it, and I saw the, the, the art in it, and I saw so many great things from it, and I said, you know what, I, I really want to do this, and so the catering company took off in Woodstock, and I flew out here to Hawaii, and I was here on the islands, and this nice. uh, person sees me eating the food that I make, and they say, this looks amazing, we'll give you $300 if you oh. make that for dinner, and I said, sure, so I made them some food, 
and they said, we'll give you $10,000 if you come with us right now to Maine and you meet this uh, 100 people in Maine for a week. And I said, wow, okay. I got off the phone. I got I got the place. I called my friend on the phone, and I said, listen, these people want me to make all this food. I don't know what I'm doing. And he's like, well, I work in produce at the, the supermarket. And I was like, I don't care. Come with me. <laughs> and I called my other friend. I said, listen, you, you know about food. He said, I work in a restaurant. I'm a waiter. I said, you, you come with me, too. You know? And I, so I grabbed anybody. <laughs> I mean, we all went together, we went up there, we made the food, it was amazing, and the last day, uh, the owner of the retreat center back here in Hawaii calls up and says, listen, I heard what you did for them, I want to make you a head chef, you come out here right away and you become the head chef at our restaurant, at our, at our cafe and the retreat center, and uh, we'll give you good money, we'll give you a house, a car, food, so I flew out, I started making all this food. How old were you in that uh, moment? Where was I? How old were you? Oh, I, I was 21, 22 years old, 22 years old. Fantastic that point. Opportunity when, then. when I left, 22 when I came back. And so I came back here, I was 22 years old, and I really wasn't sure what I was supposed to do. And, you know, I start running this retreat center with them, and people are, are coming from all over the island, sneaking in. You know, it's only supposed to be a closed retreat. People came to study with these famous massage teachers, famous chiropractors, and yoga teachers. I was supposed to be making the food for these small groups. One day the owner was there and he says, listen, there's 25 people eating dinner. I said, well, that's fine. He said, yeah, but there's only 15 people in this workshop. And I said, well, I don't run the door. I run the kitchen. And I said, I'm not within budget anyways. So who cares? He said, well, these people are sneaking in here to get your food. He said, you need a restaurant. And I said, I do. I quit. And so in 1996, I went and opened the, the first raw food restaurant here in Hawaii, uh, end of 95, beginning of 96. Raw so experience. Running, the raw experience, exactly. So I was 24, 25 years old, and I, I opened this restaurant, and it becomes a huge hit, and everybody here loved it. And we uh, start, I started releasing books and teaching classes. So that's kind of the origins of how I, I started that whole thing. And for me, a lot of it had to do with, with connection with nature, too. Like I was here in Hawaii, and we started this restaurant, but we didn't even have any money. So every day we would just pray. And we'd are, go you out a, and are you a are you a Hawaiian? Are I'm, you I'm not a Hawaiian. Hawaiian. No? I'm a New Yorker. <laughs> I'm a New Yorker. Bro. <laughs> so, so you are in paradise, yeah. right? I am. I'm in paradise now. Now, now I'm a Hawaiian. <laughs> I'm a naturalized Hawaiian. So. So yeah, so I, I picked all this fruit every day. I'd go out and climb the coconut tree. I'd pick all the avocados, oh. all the mangoes, all the papayas. And that's how we'd make the food in the restaurant was with whatever we could pick. And it finally, oh. eventually, it started to take off. And we made money, and then we could buy food and stuff like that. But it was great in the beginning when we first started. And we would just be running around the jungle early in the morning seeing what we could get, you know? Oh, that's very cool. And, and uh, going to the restaurant, the, your clients were from all, all the world or only from Hawaii? Yeah. Well, all we started world. off in a, a town called Paia, uh, was where we did the restaurant. And so because of that, it's such a, a nexus for tourists. People come there because they have to go on the way to Hana. They go through there. It's where all the surfing is. It's kind of like a very famous hippie town. Um, so because of that, we had a lot of people coming from all over the world learning about what we were doing, and people were really interested in it. And we, you know, in Maui, it's such a small little island. There's not a lot going on anyway. That uh, you know, celebrities were coming in all the time. Anyone that was like a famous person on the island, they wanted to come and check us out. People right. that were coming, you know, from different walks of life, just walking by the restaurant. I mean, our our workers were really excited and really into it because we're very much a family. We didn't, you know, work in the traditional way. I mean, we had our whole own thing. We were even, we, we had our own money we were printing called raw bucks. We had like oh. our raw food dollars oh, cool. that we printed, and we all traded them between our little family of friends. You know, I could pay you for a massage with it, and then you could buy food at the restaurant with it, and, you know, I might oh. use it to get a yoga class. And, like, so we had this, like, little thing going in our community, and so we were all, like, working together. So people would be running out into the streets from the restaurant and saying, come in, you know, like, you got to try this, like, bringing a piece of pie out into the street and saying, hey, we put the pie in Paia. The name of the town we were in is called Paia. So it's like a funny joke. We'd be these play on word. You know, people would do all sorts of stuff like that, you know, and it was great. So we'd really draw in people that didn't even know what raw food was. 
was. Had never heard of it. That, you know, had no idea about being healthy, but they were so interested. We'd have these amazing fruits. We'd have the Rolenia, or we'd have a giant jackfruit sitting right on the counter that's, you know, 90 pounds. And people would be, what, what is this? You know, like, we were right there with <laughs> coconut samurais every day. People out there, you know, and they even would do it. They'd wear the, like, samurai bandana. No. And they'd, they'd, ha! You know, and they'd make a big ha sound when they cut it. And so it'd draw a lot of attention. So we, we had a lot of people talking about us, a lot of people interested in what we're doing. You know, we very quickly were doing interviews. We were, you know, in all these magazines and, you know, in San Francisco magazines and magazines in New York and all over the place, Vegetarian Times. I mean, some of the articles were fantastic. And so that really got us popular very quick. But in getting popular so quick, we really didn't know what we were doing completely. And so it was hard to, to scale up to the amount of clientele. We all of a sudden went from this little kind of hippie thing in Maui to all of a sudden a very big interaction that we were having with the public and so uh, you know it became amazing how, how fast people loved it it took off I started teaching all over the US started helping people open restaurants in New York San Francisco and then buying another restaurant in San Francisco so I mean it became big very quick and then you wrote uh, the book uh, the raw truth right yeah, exactly so I had been working on the book beforehand uh, before I started the restaurant you know when I was at the retreat center I started writing it just under the concepts that I was really seeing. And then when we did the restaurant, we said, listen, let's finish out this book as a recipe book. It wasn't originally intended as a recipe book, more as an education book. But since we were doing so much food and it was so popular and everybody loved it, we said, hey, let's, let's do a recipe book. We started doing this book. It was selling out. We were selling more books than we were selling food. You know, people <laughs> were buying our book everywhere. It was amazing. Like, That's you know, great. we were sending books because we we couldn't send food to the United States. We couldn't send food to Europe or Africa or Asia. But we were sending books everywhere. People were ordering our book from Ooh. everywhere. They were finding us. They were sending us mail and sending us a check in the mail. And we were having to mail these books off because this was before the internet, you know. So we're, we're there. <laughs> you know, you couldn't order it on the internet. There was no Amazon.com. That's right. It, it was 1996, right? 1997. Exactly. 96, 97, 98, and 99. When we were <laughs> open. And uh, so we were running around, like, you know, I would travel places, and I would drop off books everywhere I would travel, and I'd do lectures and teach classes and stuff like that. And that was primarily how we were selling the book. We were actually, like, hand-delivering it all over the U.S., and we were mailing it all over the world. And uh, it got really popular. It became, like, a really big thing. We were selling really fast in uh, you know, some of these other people in the raw food industry started picking up the book and selling it, and then they were distributing more than we could even print. They were at that point selling faster than we could print them. I was having to find new printers and places <laughs> that could print it for me faster. So it became popular really quick, you know, which was great. How, how many and thousand of uh, copies did you sell? Uh, we sold 20,000 copies. 20,000 copies. 20,000 copies on our own, you know, just not knowing what we were doing just through the restaurant. And then we sold another about 10,000, 15,000 copies of it um, through me traveling. And then finally, we ended up uh, selling the rights. I sold the rights to it to Random House, to a big publisher, and they now publish it for me. So I don't even have to do anything. They distribute it, publish it. They made it into an ebook, so it's easily available. Everyone can get it. You don't have to find me anymore to get the book. So you know, even though it was fun back in the day that you had to meet me to get the book, now you, you can just get it anyway. So. And you are a real artist. You were telling before that you. Uh, you express yourself through music, through raw foods and art, uh, uh, martial arts. And uh, it's yeah. pretty amazing that you can do all these things. And I don't know, I really admire people so creative as you are. And uh, you created the Dragon Yoga too, right? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. That's, That's where I... I I had taken the, the Shaolin Kung Fu that I had studied since I was nine years old and I had begun to meet a lot of people that were doing yoga and I saw what they were doing and I said, oh, I know something you know very similar. I saw the similarities in it. But then as I began to get deeper into the yoga, I saw pieces that were missing from the yoga. And also from my years of Kung Fu and martial arts, I said, oh, listen, there's some things that are in these yogic teachings that are very important that have gotten lost in the martial arts because we're so oriented in martial arts on fighting and self-defense. 
yoga is oriented towards enlightenment and spiritual growth. And so I began to bridge back together those pieces, and the Qigong and the Tai Chi really helped merge that together for me. And so I started teaching this dragon yoga, which had a lot of uh, very strong practice to it. It got people into their core very fast. It got them to focus outside as well as inside and got them to develop their energy in, in a very specific way where they could really like dive into their lives in a strong way, dive into their practices in a strong way. And uh, so yeah, so I was really honored to like be able to teach that and promote that. And uh, I taught it all over to a lot of people. I have students now out there that teach it. We have a DVD out there on it. And uh, you know, it's great stuff to be able to practice, especially because it builds so much integrity, which is a big part of uh, something that you find in martial arts more than in yoga. Yoga is a lot of stretching and a lot right. of strength building, balancing, but you don't build that same, like, ability to take a hit and to feel like, you know, as strong as you possibly can in a stance or something like that. Yoga and martial arts have that, and so when I started bringing it together, it developed it even more, the... Uh, the joint ligament set, which is a, an ancient thing that the martial artists would use to prepare themselves before fighting or to repair themselves after fighting, um, became integral in actually the whole set and the whole sequence of what I teach as Dragon Yoga. Fantastic. And you have also a, a farm there, right? I, I can show it. Show here. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I have a farm. We have a 30 acre farm here in Hawaii. And, and yeah, exactly. Is, that's the picture. Awesome. Nice. Yeah, that's a, a hand-drawn picture by a friend of mine of upper part of the farm or right here next to the state reserve, it, which is... And a, you have uh, all these buildings in, on the farm? Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's kind of a, a funny thing that happened because you're only allowed to uh, build up to 200 square feet uh, without a permit, without a building permit. And so in the beginning here on the property, I was trying to figure out what I was going to do, how would I finance everything, and we thought we were going to be selling a part of the property. And so I started building uh, just these little things in the beginning so that I, couldn't, I wouldn't affect anybody's permit. If on the road we had to sell or do something with a permit, I thought, okay. And in the end, I made a lot of money, ended up buying the whole place and keeping it. But um, for all the buildings that I had built to start out with, little 200 square foot structures, and so each one is a different space. The pyramid is where I sleep. It's an amazing dream temple that oh, uh, you really all sleep in the, the pyramid. You, you really sleep in the I pyramid? sleep in the pyramid. Yeah, it's just fantastic. I do every <laughs> night. Yeah. Yeah, the pyramid's amazing. It's built all with no iron in it. It has no metal except for copper holding it together and mostly it's doweled together with wood and it has no electricity running through it near it at all. And so it's a really space for dreaming in. I'm already I'm miles from any uh, building or any house or power pole. We're right next to a 62,000 acre state reserve. So, you know, I'm very much away from everything. And the pyramid's just such a great space to dream in. You can even see it has the triangular window with a, a south facing view. See. So it has a, a great harlot scene in it. When you're in there at night, you can see the stars and everything. And uh, the uh, Hawaiian clay spring, which is down by the river. Side, we're right next to a, a big river. We're between a very special thing here. We have the forest that reaches up as the masculine principle, and we have the uh, river valley that sinks down as the feminine principle. And the, and the oh, property there is, is actually there is the positioned. river down here. Yeah. Oh, I see. yeah, that's the river. So we're <laughs> positioned right between the forest and the river, and it's incredible. And we actually we sell the clay from the spring. Uh, people harvest it here, and we sun dry it, and we powder it. And we sell it. For many people use it for facials and uh, body packs, and for uh, detoxifying their skin, and for pulling out poisons and uh, venoms and stuff like that from centipedes or mosquitoes or hornets. And uh, so the clay is a, a really big fear, and it's a very sacred thing to the Hawaiians. And so we're honored to have the spring on our property. People come and get their spring water there. People come and uh, you know do do ritual there, and it's a, a really beautiful spot. Uh, to go and, and be near the water. And so, yeah, all these buildings each have a purpose. One's for music, one's for martial arts. One of them is my library, where we're sitting right now in my, my office. And uh, Oh, you are in the library. A, I see where you are. We're in the library, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that, that's where we are right that's now. Cool. And I, I can try and like show some of the... We can try and turn around and see a little bit oh, of the, all the bookshelves and my guitar and 
the bookshelves go up very, very, very high. <laughs> How many books do you have there? Oh, many. Thousands. Probably <laughs> three, three or four thousand books probably exactly. in here. <laughs> so you know, I, I read a lot. I spend a lot of time studying. And uh, for many years, I, I didn't even you know use TV or movies or anything like that. I just mostly read. And a lot of I, I read everything from you know science. I read a lot about science. I, I'm big into studying science, uh, minerals and gemstones, music. Uh, my main, ma mostly most of the information here is health related stuff, stuff related to plants, plant medicines, herbology, uh, fruit trees, organic farming, uh, different types of health practices, fasting and cleansing, Ayurveda, Chinese medicine. And then, of course, all the yogic techniques and yogic practices, and of course, e even into so, so stuff like mystical would be, tradition. That would be a sort of your source of creativity, right? Yes, it's certainly a big part of but my you source are of creativity. Very creative. <laughs> thank, thank you. Thanks. Yeah, I, I, these days too, it's been great. I've had some really great people in my life, and so they, you know, they really inspire me in such a big way and so I've been writing a lot of poetry, a lot of short stories, inspirational quotes, you know, and I mean I still write tons and tons of music all the time, probably up to 70, 80 songs almost that I've written now and uh, my second album or actually my third album really including the single came out this year uh, called Other People's Shoes and uh, it's got you know, 12 great, great tracks on it. It's on yeah, it's so, your blog, yeah. right? It's, in, it's here somewhere. I think I can show. Yeah. Somewhere you should be able to find it on the website, I'm sure. Or, or on iTunes. Yeah. You can get it on iTunes. Evolve the vibrations. I will put I will share this. Evolve vibrations, exactly. That that's my record label. That's the record label that we run out of here out of the recording studio. Yeah, exactly. Uh, there you go. So you got and you got even a, one of the songs on there. Perfect. Yeah, look at that. Awesome. And it's you singing in the album, right? Yeah, yeah, all stuff that I sing, I play the guitar on it, I play piano on some of it, I wrote all the songs, I arranged most of it, wrote, wrote most of the parts for a lot of the other players in it, and it's got tons of, like, you know, famous musicians that live here on Maui, people that are in the alternative scene, and e even people that are in the, you know, traditional rock and roll LA kind of scene, so we got a lot of great people in there. It was done at a, a very fancy $3 million dollar studio, the guy that used to own Maranatha Nut Butters, you know, the like raw nut butters and he does all those nuts. He used to own that. He sold it and uh, he bought amazing studio here, a property that he has all solar powered studio, all done on solar. He's got Bob Dylan's yes. board. He's got Frank Sinatra's microphone. Uh, this guy Bobby Plotnick at Grace Recording Studios and he did a great job with the album. I'm really happy with all the work that he did on it and, uh, you know, it turned out great. So. I like the name of the of the the album. Other people's shoes. Thank you. It's cool. That's yeah. right. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> Thank you. And what, one other thing that I, I love is is the cover of your other book here that you show. The the fasting handbook. I, I love the the fasting handbook. Which you yeah, it's very cool. I mean, the the dish is uh, empty. <laughs> it's fantastic. That's right. Be because because the original name of the book, when I first published it, when I was self-publishing, before I sold the rights to these, when I self-published the book, it was called Dining from an Empty Bowl. And and so that was the original kind of concept of it. And it, and it teaches a lot of great stuff. The fasting book... You know, for a lot of people, they think fasting means just not eating or drinking anything, or maybe you just drink water and you don't eat anything. And I really kind of forwarded the idea with fasting on something or fasting from something, that you either decide a substance that you're going to have a, a direct interaction with, whether it be water, that's fine, or coconut water, or wheatgrass, or lemonade, or, you know, juices, or raw food even. We say, hey, for a, a week, for a month, for a year, for however long, I'm going to go and do just this one thing, right? So fasting yeah. on something. Or we say fasting from. We're fasting from speaking. Or we're fasting from, you know, people could 
fast from cooked food. People could fast from sex. People could fast from the TV or from the computer right. or from their cell phone. And so we're putting these things aside for a little while so we can live in a more austere way so we can come back to our center and come back to who we really are without the influences of other things around us. And so that's really where the idea of that book started. And so I started promoting all these different types of fasts. And I put in the ideas of, hey, here are some things that are going to make your fast or cleanse a lot easier for you. And so why don't you try these things? And it became great. And I've run a lot of workshops and retreats. People come out here to Hawaii, stay at the farm, fast. And I, I help support them through it. And we have amazing springs to bathe in here. And, of course, all the clay and the mud and tons of fruit and coconut water and some great people that are on staff here that do massage or you know, help people uh, move through all sorts of stuck states in their psyche. And so... It's been great stuff out here that goes on with the fasting. So you are receiving people in your farm all year long? All year long. I usually go away for part of the summer, usually uh, June and July I travel. So usually those are the two months that we don't have uh, people here for education. But we do have interns that come, and so some of them will even stay on into the summer. Uh, part of the program called WOOF, it's uh, Willing Workers on Organic Farms. So the people come out here and they work on the farm, and they help out, and they help build things, they help garden, and that's usually all year long. And then in the winter time, we have a lot of people that come up for retreats and fasting, people that want to go away from the cold in America, you know, it's in New York or in California or Oregon or whatever. They'll come out here, they'll spend some time, they'll study, they'll eat raw food or they'll fast. They get to go to the waterfalls and the ocean and we take people on a little tour around the island. Sometimes we do sweat lodge or fire walk. Uh, you know, we'll do medicine object creation. And you just learn how to be with nature more here. It's a, it's a much more uh, isolated, away from the world kind of place. So you really get a chance to be with nature in that way. How many miles are you from the, neck, the closest town? The closest town may be about only 15 miles, so it's not actually that far to get to town. 15 miles, it takes about 15 minutes or so to get there, or maybe, you know, half an hour. For people, if you don't know the way, you drive slow or whatever. But, uh, but yeah, it's, we're, we're very off in the forest, so it feels like you're, you know, 100 miles away. Because <laughs> I can, I, I can uh, imagine that. We're, we're up the mountain because it's a big cinder cone, the mountain, mm -hmm. and so we live at a, a, a higher point and there's nothing above us, and there's oh. nothing next to us. And so because of that, you you feel like you're very, very far away. The, the, the town is down by the ocean, and so we're up here in the forest, and it's seen, you can't see anything except for the you know ocean forever and forest forever and mountain forever, so it seems like you're just hidden in the woods, so it's great. And in the evenings, you you only see the stars, right? If you, if you only the stars, yeah. There's no... No light from town, no houses, no street lights, no nothing, no electricity anywhere nearby. Fantastic, fantastic. Yeah. And tell me something. Uh, I read in your, your in your site that you provide some consultation on sustainability and eco-friendly options too, right? Yeah, exactly, exactly. Uh, we we have you know you, you, you I mean we I, we have all sorts of different things that we offer here for uh, for accommodations and for services. Um, you know, everything from, like, beautiful little cabins that we have here on the property to places people tent. And, you know, I do a lot of work with people as far as pulse diagnosis and, uh, you know, iridology and, uh, you know, all sorts of interviews that I do with them in order to figure out what their real ideal path is so I can really put them on a, a journey while they're here so that their experience really, like, gives them a lot while they're here but also enhances their lifestyle and things that they can continue once they go home. So I try to do things that are very practical and prudent with people and things that they're going to be able to like, keep going with to help make them stronger and help them see what they can do with their lives to make it better at home and maybe even make it better for their community too, bringing people back closer to nature, which is really like the main part of my mission in this is to like help people connect with nature, with the, the elements, with the wind and with the water, with the fire, with the earth, and really work with these things, having real experiences and, and recognizing what they are and seeing how important it is to have that. Fantastic! <laughs> you you are making a, your mission a reality oh, every day. Right? You are you are living your mission. It's fantastic! And I am. Yeah, exactly. Because you know that's one of the things. Even when I travel every day, I make sure I go out and find nature. Even if I'm in New York City, 
even though I'm in, in a major city, it doesn't matter to me. I will go and find that one tree or find that one little quiet spot where there's like a, a little pond or a lake or something and be able to sit there and be in nature and be quiet. You know, there's all these great meditation techniques they teach out there that involve, you know, different types of breathing practices or, or sitting or chanting mantra. But I'm always telling people, listen, just go in nature and be quiet. That's all it really takes is go in nature, be quiet, and everything else happens. You'll start breathing deeper. You'll start moving through these things in your mind. The, the things that you need to will come up. And so I'm always saying go to nature because that's the greatest healer that we're ever going to have and ever going to find. And so through that also, I like to receive from nature. So every day I try to make part of my practice, whether it's that I go gather fresh spring water from a spring or I pick a piece of fruit or I find a rock that's really special to me and I make offering with it or I find a feather from a bird and I stick it on the dashboard of my car. Or, you know, and I would like to receive from it because I, I realize it's a gift being shown to me because it's a gift and if we pay attention, we find more and more of that. That's why I still, to this day, pick fruit all over Hawaii because I pay attention because I see, oh, look, here this tree is showing me. It didn't have to show me its fruit. I see the fruit because it's meant for me to eat it. I'm feeling called by it. And so I go and I, even if it's on someone's front lawn, I'll go and knock on the door and I'll say, listen, you know, I saw your fruit tree. Mangoes are falling all over the sidewalk. Is it okay if I pick a few mangoes? They say, I'll take them all. You know, so then I get to, and I go and give them away to all the people that I see. I say, hey, let me share these with everyone. It came to me for free. I'll just give it away for free. You know, and so it becomes a great thing. Oh, I end up going home with still a hundred mangoes and filling the freezer. <laughs> oh, sure. oh, yeah, of course, because it, there's so many here. You know, it's it's such a, a popular place for fruit. Fruit loves growing in Hawaii. Mangoes especially grow so well here that in the summertime we have as many as you. The whole ground is covered with a rainbow. Rainbow sidewalks in Hawaii because of the mangoes. And, and do you have uh, bananas there too? Oh, a lot of bananas. Yeah, bananas again, something that grows wild everywhere. So you can just go to these groves and patches and just pick them. I mean, here I, even on my property, I probably have over a hundred banana trees that just grow everywhere. They just grow wild down by the river and in the forest. And you know, people bring all the time too when we go hiking. We'll see like a little cluster, and you see at the bottom of it all the babies. We call them a, a keiki. I mean, maybe a small young pet, and we break them off, and you bring them home, and you stick them down by the river, and they just boom into a whole whole little cluster of bananas grows right out of it. <laughs> it's fantastic. How much does yeah. it cost to one kilo of bananas in the supermarket in Hawaii? Well, one kilo of bananas is probably, uh, bananas are cheap here. I mean, a dollar a pound, you know, maybe 50 cents a pound is, is on the cheap side, and a dollar a pound is on the high side. So what is that in kilos that's like, you know, probably two dollars a kilo. Is that sound about right? A between a dollar and two dollars a kilo, I guess. Okay. No, I, I'm making a comparison because I'm talking in these interviews with people like you who are in um, Hawaii, but someone is in Thailand and so on, and then <laughs> just trying to find out if I pay too much here in Brazil. You see. Right, right. It, it all depends. I mean, here, it's it's so easy to just meet somebody and say to them, hey, can I come pick bananas at your place tomorrow? And they say, of course, please take them, because otherwise, if you don't pick the banana, fruit flies are everywhere, and then the rats come, and there's chickens jumping around the tree, and like, you know, so they say, take them. People just say, yeah. take it every day. They're just like, go take them away, you know, so... It, it, it's so abundant here that way that people just pick banana. Everyone has banana stalks hanging in front of their house, and you walk over to your friend's house, the first thing you you get there to his little porch, you're just eating a couple bananas while you say hi. Sometimes even before you've knocked on the door, you're eating the, your friend's banana. <laughs> That's you know, Because they're just all hanging there. There's just a lot, a lot of these stalks of bananas hanging. If, we, if I could take the computer outside, I could go show you my stock, but I don't know if I could move it that far from the Internet. But uh, <laughs> yeah, every, everybody just has banana stalks hanging, so... Okay, it's, it's fantastic to talk to you, Jeremy, and to see all the energy that you are uh, uh, showing, and oh, and uh, it's uh, it's uh, reaching me. You know, it's <laughs> I'm right. I'm pumped up now just by talking <laughs> with you. <laughs> fantastic. Well, right. your life changed a lot since you became a vegan and are a vegan, right? Uh, we can Very say much. this, and uh, then I, I have my last question for you today. Yeah, it's a huge question, but uh, a small answer. Uh, comparing the person you were before and the person you are now, 
or maybe just after be, uh, becoming a raw vegan, what is your raw vegan power? <laughs> My raw vegan power is that I can see life in nature, that I can really see like so easily from doing it, it guides me. Like I said, the trees guide me right to them. The spring water calls me right to it every time. I can, I can smell the treasure in the tree. Like I can like tell if I'm driving by, I'm like, wait, stop, hang on, there's a tree. And people are like, I don't see any tree. I was like, hang on, we go walk back into the woods and right there you'll find all the oranges. Like I can see where that life force is really flowing in such a big way. I, I follow the ley lines, I follow the rivers, I follow the, the mountain ridges and peaks. And because of that, I'm like so in tune all the time. I find like I never get lost in the forest. I can always really? find my way. And, I, and I'm so close. Like, the animals will come right up. I can walk usually within like two feet of the wild boar or the wild deer. Like I can get very, very close to all the animals here because I, I, I know how to talk to them. I start singing to them usually and they just will become yes. very calm and I can go very close to the animals and it, it's great, you know. So because of that, I think becoming a raw foodist and a raw vegan really helped me in such a big way get so much closer to nature, to have them feel okay, have animals feel okay with me, have the trees to call to me, to be able to like really surrender to the weather, even to like be okay with walking in the rain. I mean, I spent many years walking in the rain up here and it's like such a blessing. You know, sure you want to hide under the tree for a second, we were trying to get somewhere, you keep going, you know. So I, I really trust in nature. I trust in the wind. I trust in the water. I trust in the fruit. And I certainly trust in the animals. So uh, that's, I'd say, is my raw vegan power. It's a huge raw vegan power. It's, uh, it's almost <laughs> paranormal. It's something surreal right? most people. Oh, yeah. But I believe you because I, 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 well, I started one year in, uh, in some months uh, I think it was 2011 when I started, and I'm I'm uh, beginning to realize all this power that you get. And and, and uh, could you say that this improves over the the years? Oh yeah, it it just keeps improving. The more the more that we know that the tree is where food comes from and not the supermarket, the more it improves. So many people are just so caught up in thinking that the store is the source of food. And they forget about the tree. They forget about the plants that are growing. And so for me, it, yeah, it just keeps improving and your knowledge improves. As I've learned what are plants that are herbs that I can use in a certain way or, you know, what wild greens I can eat or I find the usefulness in all things. You know, it's a, there's a, a great story from one of my Chinese teachers. He'd say, he took, you know, the master, he took all the students out into the woods and he said, I'm going to retire and one of you must become the new teacher. Who will become the new teacher? He said, I send you all out and you have till sunset to come back with as many plants as you can find that have no use at all, that are useless plants, right? Huh. And so he sends them out and sure enough, it's getting dark and the first student comes back and he's got two plants in his hand. He's like, I know these two are the two that he means and I have them. I'm the first one back. I'm going to win. Well, soon enough, another student comes back. He's got five plants. And oh, the first student's looking around saying, oh, no, I can't believe I missed out on those ones. He's looking and looking, can't find a few other students come back, have a couple more. They're waiting, waiting. The last student still hasn't come back. They're still waiting. All of a sudden, it's all the way dark. The last student comes back and says, master, master, I'm so sorry. I cannot find a single plant in the entire forest with no use. And the master says, you are the new master. Because that is the truth. <laughs> there is every plant in the world has a use. It has a purpose. And it's a matter of when knowing what and knowing how. It's knowing what that plant is supposed to do, how to use that plant, and when it's proper to harvest. Do we get the root and we have to make it into a poultice for the skin? Is it that we get the leaf but we have to steam it or juice it or let it dry in the sun first? What way will we use this plant? But every plant has a way to be used. And so the longer and more time that I've spent as a raw foodist, the more plants that I've seen that I can use all raw, ways to use them, how to work with them, what they're really about, the right time of year, time of day to even harvest them, how to get the flower from it when it's right, how to get the root when it's right, the leaf when it's right. So, you know, that's it for me, it's been such a great thing. The longer that I've gone, the more connected I felt with nature and the more guided I felt by nature. Fantastic. Thank you for your, your testimony here, um, Jeremy. It's, it's, it's so You're nice welcome. to hear that, especially for me, who I am a beginner, right? <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, Jeremy. It was a great pleasure and a huge honor to talk to you today.
Thank you so much. All right. All right. Aloha. And, uh, and you who are watching, go now and take a look at jeremysaffron.com and see all the great stuff that uh, Jeremy has to offer you. Bye-bye, Jeremy. Thank Aloha. you so much. Bye-bye. Peace.